Pleasant good evening and welcome to From Our Hearts with Rodika and Ken on Island Zone Radio. Unfortunately, or should I say fortunately, Brown Sugar is in, I think, Dominica or one of those islands in the Caribbean. She's having fun. I saw her today. She looked very relaxed. So um, so we decided that I will ask you today, and thank you very much, Rusat, um, for those. I, I should, Rusat is a known figure in our community for most of you who know him, I <clears throat> always say to myself, and even today I was was relaxing, I says that Rusev, you have a bright future ahead of you, and um, it's just a matter of time before your light starts to shine so bright in this world, and where you'll be able to make a big difference. <coughs> Excuse me. And <clears throat> also, I have to say that I'm very lucky that uh, we are blessed to have Indy Mohan to, in studio with us, She's sitting not too far from us, um, so she'll be listening to all the things that you have to say. So, Ruset, I want to say thank you very much for coming in on such a short notice. How are you doing today? I'm good. Well, I would always come on short notice for you. I always make time for Uncle Ken because okay. I, I, I can't talk about me as a person. Coming Uncle Ken is one of the you know, most humble and kind and supportive people you'll, you'll see in the community. So it's always a pleasure. When I got a call from you to, to come in and be on the show today, I always appreciate it. And it's always a blessing to see you as well. Thank you. Thank you. So, you know, Rusat, this border dispute that we have going on between Venezuela and Guyana, it has been a long time, even before you and I were yeah. born. Yeah. And I'm kind of surprised that um, we are here at this time when we know that years ago, that all of these things has settled in the world code. Take it away, Rusat. So um, there's, there's a few things with it. And I would say, obviously, I come at this from the background of having Guyanese heritage, right? Both right. my parents are from Guyana. But I also come at it from the background that, uh, for those who don't know, in terms of like uh, my uh, professional background, I have 
uh, my law degree is an LLB and an LOM, and I specialize in international law. So I also previously worked for the U.S. State Department, which is you know, the foreign policy right, arm of, the, of, the, by, but <laughs> go ahead. Uh, of, of the U.S. government. So the so I do have a background and, and passion in, in foreign policy, so I also look at it from that aspect. Uh, so when you look at the, the Venezuela guy, uh, conflict crisis, whatever word you want to call it, and also for the record, when I was at the University of London, I did one of the authoritative projects on the Venezuela guy and issue. So I could, you know, right. off, uh, uh, so we have the authority here in the studio. <laughs> so the, while it, it may seem you know, settled for some people, there, there's always a risk of something that is settled becoming unsettled when you have a figure like, say, a Nicolas Maduro. Uh, when you look at Nicolas Maduro, Nicolas Maduro is probably the the most fragile leader Venezuela has ever had. Uh, so like you, you, the point you're saying just now, this is something that's been going on since before I was born or before you were born. The other day when I'm talking to my dad about it, he said, man, I was a small boy growing up in Guyana really? hearing about this. Uh, that, uh, like, well, what are you really going to do now? And the point I'm making is, unlike, say, Hugo Chavez in the past or you know other Venezuelan leaders, Maduro is actually very vulnerable within the Venezuelan system. But one of the things that you'll hear is some people believe that Maduro did all this as a distraction because he has elections coming up next year in Venezuela, right. and this is something that he wants to do to distract the Venezuelan population. So when, when you have a leader facing things like that, one of the things that they'll do is distract their people. The, the, the Esequibo issue has always been something that unites the, the Venezuelan uh, people relatively so, and so you could predict that he would want to bring it back up. When it comes to like whether or not it's settled. So you had an 1899 decision that was accepted, but Venezuela since 1962 effectively has always been every few years or so saying something, one thing or another. Right. And then you, you combine that with a leader like Maduro, you can get a bad situation. Like, okay, you compare 1899 is when this you know was supposed to be resolved. 1899 is also when the uh, dispute over the regions that are now Iraq and Kuwait as a border dispute was supposed to be resolved since then. But in 1990, what happened? Iraq invaded Kuwait, right? Right. 91 years after it was solved, that border dispute was solved. In the 1800s, the Falklands dispute was thought to be settled. But in 1982, what happened? Argentina invaded the Falklands to try to retake the Falklands from Great Britain because Argentina had a leader in Galtieri who, like Maduro now, thought that, okay, I'm facing a vulnerable situation in my own country, let me distract the population. So the same thing with Saddam in 1990. Saddam was trying to distract his population who were unhappy with the aftermath of the Iran-Iraq war and said, let me distract my population, let me do this. So in a way, while it may be surprising that something like this pops up now, if you follow the pattern of leaders in history and, and where, uh, you know, border disputes, how, how they tend to go, it's not that surprising at the same time as well. If you look at it ob objectively from that sample. When I, you know, my, this is my personal opinion about Maduro. Um, I think he's a bully. Yeah, you know, um, he is. He's a bully. He is um, unpredictable. And so uh, we don't know what's yeah. going to happen next. Um, yeah. And when you have people like that, you have to keep an eye on them. Yes. And especially, okay, if you look at what's going on in the world right now, right? You have a Ukraine crisis going on right now. And what was that caused by? It was also caused by a border dispute, in, in a sense. Uh, there's a lot of larger things, too, but uh, Russia has, you know, and Putin in particular has his worldview on Ukraine, which dates back to their history. If you look at Putin's rationale for why he went into Ukraine, you know, that, that Ukraine used to be part of the Soviet Union, and that if you date back to the Russian Empire in 1917, that, that in his opinion, Ukraine was never actually supposed to leave Russia, and things like that. So, and, it was thought by the Ukrainians that that issue was settled. But what happened? When you have a, a madman like Putin, 2022, he actually invades. And many people thought, okay, if you think back just a year and a half ago, I remember right before Putin invaded, many people were like, he's not actually going to invade. He's just talking. Right? Do you remember winter 2021 when he was building up his troops right by the Ukrainian border? And people said, he's not actually going to invade. He's not actually going to invade. And then he invaded. Right? So look, Maduro may not actually invade. I don't want to like start scaring people and say, oh, Maduro. He may not actually invade, but when you deal with a madman like that, you have to be prepared for that chance. And when a leader like Maduro sees what's going on both, you, Putin is largely getting away with what he did in Ukraine, right? F flaring up that tension and you know, having a war that costs a lot of innocent lives. What's going on right now with Israel and Gaza, mm -hmm. right? And these international crises are shifting the attention that would otherwise be placed on Maduro. Okay, if Maduro was doing this during any, any other time period in the past few years, there'd be a large international spotlight on him. The whole world would be saying, 
man, what's this guy doing? You know, he, we can't allow him to do it. Just like when Saddam did what he did to Kuwait, the whole world united relatively and said, Saddam can't do this to Kuwait. But right now, the larger international community is so distracted by the Ukraine issue and the Israel issue that it's allowing Maduro this back in which he could do something like this and there's not enough spotlight being placed on him. But, but you say that, um, and I know that Americans are involved in what's going on in Guyana. So um, I, I don't think that we need to really worry too much. But let's talk a little bit. Um, they send, the guy that got Ben sent a delegation here, um, and our attorney general. Uh, be, before we move on to that, I, I want that, another point I should touch on here for the sake of balance. Okay, so there's all these reasons why I said you should be worried. One of the reasons you also, the reasons you should, that you should not be worried, uh, there's many ways to look at how the referendum went yesterday. So the referendum passed, yes, it, you know, it, it was it was always going to pass in terms of majority of Venice, people who actually went to vote in Venezuela were going to vote a certain way, but not as many people apparently turned out in Venezuela to vote as was expected, right? right, right. Maduro thought that he would have a lot more people turn out to vote. Apparently, it, obviously it's hard to get exact official numbers in Venezuela, but it looks like that it, it, he didn't get, say, the mass support that he was, was looking for, right? So even though the number may say there's different numbers floating around right now, but it looks at that 95% of those who voted went uh, in favor of uh, the referendum, but that's of those who voted, and it seems like not that many people actually voted. So this could be, you know, 95% of 30% of the population, which, you know, 95% 30, that's only about a quarter of the population. And I'm just throwing a number there with 30. We don't know exactly how many people voted, but it doesn't seem like it was that much. And if you're Maduro, that you can, you can either lead you to go two ways. Either you could say, okay, I'm gonna you know, slowly back away because I didn't get as much support as I expected, or it could make you double down and because you've already you know, gone down this road and now you feel even more threatened. So it, there, there are various ways to look at it, but that's another reason. To look at. And also, you know, maybe you're not going to be as worried because you've seen certain, like, the, like from the Guyanese standpoint, you're not going to be as worried because you've seen certain stuff, say, uh, uh, from the U.S. They had you know, a, uh, a visit by the Department of Defense and certain drills done in the past week that, that were was done to send a message. So there are, you know, reasons to be worried and there's reasons not to be worried as well. Right. Um, you know, I'm, to be honest with you, I didn't really give you any question, much question. I probably got about five questions, but. You know, looking back, um, Maduro, a lot of the Venezuelan people are leaving Venezuela. A lot of people yeah. are leaving Venezuela, going to different parts of the, the world, mm -hmm. the Caribbean. They're going to Central America, South America. They're coming to the States. Why don't he really focus on making the people that he has in Venezuela happy that come in and now want to fight in Guyana? It's a very, it's a very complex question with that. I mean, look, okay. So if, if you if you look at Maduro's situation, right? So, so Maduro inherited the uh, the Venezuelan presidency from Hugo Chavez. If, if you want to go back in the story, so Hugo Chavez uh, died in 2013. Um, Maduro becomes president after that. He wins his first election very closely, right? It was it was a very close election, and he wins it. And the, Venezuela was always a very rich country, right? I mean, most right. most Guyanese uh, uh, would think back that the one time it used to be Guyanese going to Venezuela, oh, and not Venezuelans going, going to Guyana. Right, right. It was you know, one of the most developed countries in, in the Western Hemisphere at one time. But the Venezuela, Venezuela was a petro state. It was largely built on oil. And as, you know, for, there's a variety of reasons that you could go into, but look, at the end of the day, mismanagement, uh, mismanagement of the Venezuelan economy, the, the social <coughs> system that they adopted, a lot of things resulted in failure. They had hyperinflation. You have a massive refugee crisis from Venezuela. The, the country is in shambles. You have you know, people going to Guyana, people going to Trinidad from Venezuela. Maduro is in, in, he, he's in a crisis. It's not easy to fix a bad uh, state like that. It's easier to distract from a bad state like that. And if you're him, I don't think Maduro is really focused on improving the lives of the Venezuelan people. If he was, he would, have acted, he would have acted very differently. Okay, if you look at, for example, so 2019 is when you have the presidential crisis in Venezuela between uh, Maduro and, and uh, Juan Guaido was the guy trying to oppose him. And it's interesting, I, I happen to mention Juan Guaido. It goes back to my earlier point that 
the Escobar issue was always on, let's say, united the Venezuelans. Even when Maduro and Guaido were fighting for power in Venezuela in 2019, one of the few issues they agreed on was Venezuela. And I don't know what was, was Escobar. Juan Guaido, who was the opposition to Maduro, who at, the, at that time the U.S. was, was saying, oh, would, would rather Guaido than Maduro. Even Guaido wanted to go after Escobar at some point. So this was something that Venezuelans across the spectrum uh, were, you know, on this as a quibble issue, but it, it may be a little different now because the, the current opposition figure to Maduro actually was opposed to this referendum. But the, uh, yeah, as, as Imran says, no, yeah, we, we, yeah, 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 no but, but yeah, so okay, look, if I'm in Maduro shoes right now, I can't fix Venezuela right now. Like, no, no one man can fix Venezuela. Venezuela's in a, in a mess, the likes of which few countries have ever seen in the history of the world. I can't fix Venezuela, but if I want to stay in power and save my own skin, I can distract the people and hold on to power for a few more years, and this is one of the ways I'll do it. Oh wow! Let's go. I see. Um, let's see what um, my brother um, Imran says. I agree that Maduro chooses the right time to go up to Guyana, since the U.S. has somewhat exhausted some of its resources with two conflicts. Um, what's your take on his? I, I think I think Imran is is, uh, is, is, is is on the ball there. I mean, look the look, obviously. And th there's a lot of reasons why the U.S. should pay attention to the kind of Venezuela issue, and we will go into that uh, as the show goes on. But right now, the fact is, if you okay, if you go around to the people in Washington D.C. and you ask the politicians in Congress, what conflict are they focused on? Ninety-nine percent of them are either going to tell you Ukraine or Israel. I don't think anyone's going to tell you kind of Venezuela. So the fact that you know, everybody is distracted by that, it does give Maduro that opportunity. Whereas, say, in, okay, like in 2019, had you asked them, many of them were focused on Venezuela. E even, um, I, you, I remember even, the, the, there was a brief incident, I believe it was, um, I think it was, was it December of, uh, it was either December 2018, 2019, where Venezuela had you know, done some type of uh, reckless rhetoric and uh, movements that they were doing. And it was a, it was a bit, like what uh, Saddam was doing before Kuwait, and I, the U.S. National Security Advisor John Bolton put out a, a statement that we're not allowed, we're not going to allow Venezuela to do anything to Guyana. Whatever. So in 2018-19, the U.S. National Security Advisor John Bolton would do that because there was no Israel situation, Ukraine situation to distract the U.S. National Security Advisor. Right now, the, the U.S. National Secure, Security Advisor Jay Sullivan hasn't said anything yet about the Guyana-Venezuela issue. Oh, anyway, yeah. because he, if you look, at what is he? His press conferences are all focused on the Israel conflict and the Ukrainian conflict because you know those are what is, you know, that, as Imran said, that is what the U.S. is exhausting most of its resources behind right now. And so yesterday, coming to <coughs> yesterday, both of us went to that meeting uh, with Alan and so on. And what's your take on that meeting yesterday? <coughs> so I, I think that um, the, the meeting it was it was a good thing to have the meeting to. Uh, engage the diaspora. Obviously, the, the diaspora in New York is very important to Guyana. I mean, and if it if it's not for the political awareness of the, uh, well, I, 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 before going, in, in Imran said a question that that, that I we just want to address quickly. So Imran, you, should we be more worried than Bolsonaro? What might assist Maduro in the future in our growth? No, because Imran Bolsonaro isn't president of Brazil anymore, which is unfortunate. For the situation right now, because Bolsonaro, in my opinion, would never have helped Maduro because you know Bolsonaro is to the right, Maduro is a hardcore socialist. However, Lula is a bit of a is a bit of a you know more in the middle figure. You know, Bolsonaro would always be opposed to Maduro, and I think Bolsonaro would be better for for Guyana than Lula right now. That's my personal opinion. You know, Lula can be interesting in the situation because Lula is a leftist. He does have a relationship with Venezuela and Maduro, but also Lula does have. A long-standing personal relationship with Guyana and uh, a former president, uh, Barack Jaggi, in particular. So Lula, you know, I, I think Lula would be an interesting figure, a sort of mediator to, to try to you know, tone the tensions down because Lula, as you know, the head of Brazil, the, the largest country in the region, uh, the, the, I would actually say you know watch Brazil closely, watch Brazil and what they're doing, and also watch Brazil closely because you know we're talking about whether you should be worried or not. The Brazilian news reports had that the Brazilian intelligence a few days ago believed that the Venezuelan military would invade. 
and Brazil was preparing their own uh, was preparing their own country and their own government for the potential of what that could mean for Brazil. So if Brazil is preparing themselves for it, then you know, obviously Guyana should prepare itself for it. <laughs> but but uh, the, the, the question was about um, you know, the meeting yesterday, right? right. What, what did we think of the meeting? Yeah, no, I think it was, it was good that they, that they came and they engaged the diaspora. Uh, obviously, you know, I have a lot of respect for the individuals who were there and um, you know, represented Guyana. Oh, you had a, uh, the Attorney General Anand Nandalal, you had uh, the former president and the current ambassador, Sam Hines, you had a Carolyn Rodriguez Burkett, and you had uh, 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 Michael, Michael Burleson, the, the consul, consul general, general in New York, York and, and you have uh, the, the, the the former vice president, former foreign minister, and former finance minister, minister Carl Greenwich. Greenwich. That was, good. was there. Uh, personally, I was very impressed with Carl Greenwich. I think Carl Greenwich is a you know very very intelligent and level-headed individual. I have the greatest uh, respect for for what he's done in this case, and it, it shows that Guyana is united across uh, you know political parties. In, in, uh, when it comes to this issue, right? That uh, you know, Carl Greenwich is a you know, PNC individual, right? right? But he is still representing Guyana in this case before the ICJ because when it comes to this issue, the party doesn't matter. It's the Guyanese interest that matters. Now, uh, I, I thought it was uh, you, it was very good that they were there. They informed the, the audience. There was a good audience there. I, I do think, however, that uh, that you, when you listen to, to some of the other speeches, I'm not, I'm not talking about Carl Greenwich, I'm talking about uh, some of the other speakers, I think some of them have, uh, the, and yeah, I, I don't want to criticize them too much because obviously you don't know what it's like in their position right now, but I'd say I think some of them are just emphasizing too much on the past, right, without talking about necessarily the, the actual current state that you face right now. Most, Most people, people know the history, history the 1899 decision, Schomburg line, all those things. Reiterating 1899 and Schomburg line and that you know, our, the arbitral decision and Geneva uh, agreement, all those things, I, I don't think that's really getting you anywhere right now. Like obviously, th that is what has to be argued before the court and the ICJ, and that is what you know, has to be done to get that ICJ decision. But you know, telling an audience the whole history again, I don't see how far that gets you. I think you need to focus on telling the audience, what is your course of action right now? What is your plan right now to deal with it? And you have to realize, if Venezuela right now is like a rogue state. It doesn't respect the authorities, it doesn't respect the UN, doesn't respect the ICJ. When it, well, I shouldn't say it doesn't respect the UN. That's too proud of a statement. It doesn't respect the, the ICJ really when it comes to, to this issue. And if you have to you have to take this it is if maduro is like a rogue figure like a saddam hussein type figure your preparations have to go beyond just the icj and look a figure like saddam hussein wasn't deterred by oh the international community will do this to you no, saddam hussein ended up in very kuwait anyway and i think that's something that, that i'm not telling people to be too worried about it but i'm saying that's something that you do have to take into consideration that you're, you're dealing with a figure like that, you know. I heard one of the speakers yesterday, and they're they're talking about you know ICJ, ICJ, and and that if the ICJ rules this way and Venezuela goes against it, we'll go to the UN Security Council, and if we go to the UN Security Council, we'll get this, this, and this. At the end of the UN Security Council operates in a way where if one of the permanent members, if one of either the United States, Russia, China, the United Kingdom, or France, if only one of them vetoes, right? And I'll explain this for the for the audience too. Most, Most people, people think, think that, that when you go to the UN, oh, it's, you get the majority of countries behind you, you're good. No, no, no. When you go to the UN, if you have one of the permanent members veto an action, then the action cannot be taken at the Security Council. So if you go to the UN Security Council, okay, so, so, so let's play it out this way. ICJ rules in favor of Guyana. Venezuela is still threatening Guyana. Venezuela goes to Guyana, right? If you go to the UN Security Council and you tell the UN Security Council that we need this response, that response, sanctions, military response, whatever it is, name it. And Russia says we veto because Russia is allied with Venezuela. And if, well, Russia will not want Venezuela to be punished for interfering in Guyana when Russia is doing the exact same thing in Ukraine right now. So, so Russia would veto. And if Russia vetoes, well, then that effectively neuters the UN path, and therefore you have to be preparing the alternatives. If if not the UN Security Council path, what are the other paths you're prepared to explore? Is it, say, a, a US-based alliance of uh, that 
it, it could economically and potentially even militarily respond to Venezuela if, if they do that. You know, I was I was on another program the other day, and I said that that if you look if you look at the history of conflicts like this, you do need to have a big brother behind you. Okay. Venezuela is not deterred by Guyana military. Guyana is a small country, as well as a big country, has a much larger military than Guyana. Right, we are no match right? If, if Venezuela goes to war with Guyana, Guyana itself, I'm, and no disrespect to the, to the brave Guyanese soldiers, but Guyana itself will not be able to defeat Venezuela. Guyana needs an ally to deter Venezuela, right? It's like, okay, if, if somebody wanted to, to go fight with you on Fukan, right? I, you don't want to fight them alone. You want to have Mike Tyson with you. Right, right, right. You want to have Mike right. Tyson with you to, 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 to back you up. Right. Right. So, so in the same way, if Venezuela wants to pick a fight with Guyana, you don't want to be fighting alone. You want Mike Tyson behind you. In this case, the U.S. is, is Mike Tyson. Right. You want the U.S. behind you. Right. And that is something that I think I'm not saying that hasn't been pursued at all. Obviously, it's been pursued to a certain extent, but that, that is where, where I think the focus should be. If you look, for example, when Kuwait was attacked by Saddam's Iraq, what was the focus of the Kuwaitis? Get the U.S. alliance, get the U.S. response, and H.W. Bush was determined, get Saddam out of Kuwait. If you look at Ukraine right now, Russia invades Ukraine, or, and even before Russia was invading Ukraine, what was the Ukrainian response? We have to get American support, and without the American financial and armed support that Ukraine's getting now, they wouldn't be able to defend the country as well as they're doing. So in any situation, you do need to have a big brother defending you. Uh, so, so I think, I think, I think Guyana risks at this time, uh, you know, if we talk about what I heard of the meeting yesterday, I, I think one of the biggest risks right now is having too many eggs in the same basket, right? We, we always say, you don't want all the eggs in one basket. I think there's too many eggs right now being placed in this basket relying on, oh, well, if it comes to that, UN going to protect this, ICJ going to protect this. I think you got to, yes, you have to go through the ICJ route, you have to pursue the UN route, but at the same time, you have to be pursuing the alternative routes as well, including U.S.-based alliance, including you know other options as well. We talk about you know the the Rio Treaty or the OAS or things like that. So the okay, so like in Europe right now, one of the things that Ukraine wanted, which is why Russia ended up uh, invading before Ukraine could get it, is Ukraine wanted NATO membership, right? You keep hearing NATO membership. Why did Ukraine want NATO membership? Because NATO at the core of NATO is an agreement. An attack against one is an attack against all. Right, that's the, it's called collective defense, right? So if, if say, so most of Western Europe and the US and Canada are part of it. If somebody attacks, okay, so, so if say Russia attacks Poland, right? Because Poland and Russia need to, if Russia attacks Poland, Poland is part of NATO. An attack against one is an attack against all. The US would be tied into that. The US would have to respond to that as a NATO member if Article 5 is invoked. Now that is why, for instance, Russia would invade Ukraine but not invade Poland. Russia would not invade Poland because they know invading Poland means bringing the US in. But Ukraine didn't have that backing. Ukraine didn't have Mike Tyson on the side yet. Like, and that's what Zelensky was trying to get, but he wasn't able to get it yet. And then Russia invaded in the meantime. But if you, if, sorry to butt in, but I want to say, right, from a layman, from, you know, I'm Guyanese, what I want to say is that Guyana, and you could, you could make a difference, um, make a difference, um, what I'm saying is that I think Guyana is at a good place. And why we are at a good place? Because we have the oil. And so that's what we can hold on. And because we, right now, you talk about Big Brother, yeah, yeah. we have the United States, we have um, the Caribbean is going to back us. We probably have England, um, Canada. So I, I want to feel yeah. that we are a good place. And I think, you know, America wants to destroy Venezuela a long time, yeah, yeah. you know, allegedly, let me use the word allegedly, want to, to attack Venezuela. And probably this may, I think if Venezuela only starts something with Guyana, they're done. Mm -hmm. Talk to me. Uh, so, uh, I think, okay, you, you mentioned the oil. The, the oil is important, right? Because look, if Guyana didn't have the oil, in the, in the one hand, Venezuela probably won't be roaring this up right now, right? Absolutely. That's, right? That, that, that's one of the main reasons that, that Venezuela would be looking at this too. Guyana having the oil also means that the U.S. is the largest foreign director in investment, investor in Guyana. You do have Exxon Mobil and all these companies, mm -hmm. which if Guyana is attacked, that means you know the U.S. would be more likely to want to respond because of all this. And also the, the amount of you know the American business ties and citizens that would be in Guyana too. So, so yeah, yeah, that, is that is a good thing, thing that they have the oil. Mm -hmm. The other yeah, thing that I would say, though, is that 
look, I, I'm sure the oil money is being spent in a lot of good ways. Guyana is developing as an economy. When you develop as an economy, you should also develop your military. And I don't, I do not think that Guyana has done. A, uh, 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 I don't think Guyana has done as much as it probably should have in terms of, along with the oil money coming in, developing that military at the same time. And that's something that Guyana should have, have done and, and probably do, do now and continue to do in the future. Because, look, okay, we've always known Venezuela is larger than Guyana, has a larger military than Guyana. Venezuela was always historically richer than Guyana. Absolutely. Now, now Guyana is getting rich. Right. Now Guyana needs to develop its own military as I well. I agree. I totally agree to with that you. point. So that way it doesn't have to always keep relying on other countries as well. Absolutely. So, so yes, yes it, the oil is a good thing that it will attract other countries to, to want to defend Guyana because of their ties and investments. But at the same the oil is also a reason why you should e spend even more time and money on defense. I, I think that, um, you know, we don't know the background of what's going on right yeah. now, but I want to, I, I have the same um, sentiments as you. I think now is the time where Guyana should really invest in its military. Yeah. And, they should start. I mean, we don't know what they're doing, if they're doing it or not, but I'm sure they're smart enough to, to know these things. You know what I mean? Um, <clears throat> where China stands in all of this, because I, I was told that um, China is part of the Isle deal too. Yeah, well, well, well China is a country that has both economic ties with both Venezuela and Guyana, so China's largely remained you know, neutral, neutral in this. <laughs> and, China, and that's you know, part of China's pattern. They, they don't really you know, pick sides or get involved too much in in uh, a lot of these uh, foreign policy situations. If, if you look at, for example, even with uh, Israel-Gaza right now, right, or, or Russia-Ukraine, you don't see China getting in a, a, as involved as America, right? China flexes more of its economic might than a military might, if, if you uh, look at it historically. I, I, I know you, you may have to... Get, no, 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 that's all right, you go ahead. Yeah. Um, you, let me yeah. let you take a deep yeah. breath yeah. while I play another song by a nice, um, you, you know, what I, one of the things is that so many people playing these songs and mm -hmm. singing these songs. So let me play a nice song, uh, not One Blade of Grass, again, by a young girl singing it. Peaceful people struggle as we struggle, and we don't look for trouble, just ask around. But when outside faces from foreign places talk about taking over, we ain't backing down. We ain't giving up no mountains, we ain't giving up no tree, we ain't giving up no river that belongs to we. Not one blue sake, not one rice grain, not one grass, not a blade of grass. This land is all I know. We're gonna make it somehow. We will bend like a bow, but never break. Our fathers came here, and they lived and died here. And we ain't moving nowhere, make no mistake. We ain't giving up no mountains, we ain't giving up no tree, we ain't giving up no river, that belongs to we. Not one blue sake, not one rice grain, not one grass, not a blade of grass. We love the open county of the Ropononi and the Essequibo. Daytime or night, though we may criticize it, this is our home, we love it, and we need to keep it, we have that right. We ain't giving up no mountains, we ain't giving up no tree, we ain't giving up no river, that belongs to we, not one blue sake, not one rice grain. A blade of grass. We ain't giving up no mountains. We ain't giving up no tree. We ain't giving up no river that belongs to we. Not one blue sake. Not one rice grain. Not one grass. Not a blade of grass. We ain't giving up no mountains. We ain't giving up no tree. Not one rice. 
welcome back to From Our Hearts with Radhika and Ken on Island Zone Radio. And if you don't know, this show airs every Monday night from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And um, for those of you who don't know Rusat, Rusat has been on my show for, a, you know, every time I have a problem in our community um, about any legal stuff, I always call him. So, uh, Rusat, tell us a little bit about um, as somebody that said that you're smart. He is Thank a smart you. young man. He has a whole encyclopedia in his head. So, Rusat, dad, I know, was an attorney. He, Rusat also went to um, law school. So, tell our viewers a little bit more about you. Yeah, so um, you, for, for those who don't know me, it's a pleasure to get to know you this way. Yeah, so yeah, I've known Uncle Ken a while. I come on the show every now and then, right? For the past couple of years, it's now always a pleasure to be on. So I do have the the legal background and the sense of, uh, I, and especially when it comes to international law, you know, like I I didn't specialize say, in criminal law or or you know real estate laws. I, when I went to school, I started, I specialized in international law, which so that's why a topic like this I could go in depth on. But at the same time, I do come from a Guyanese. Uh, you know, background in, in terms of my parents. Obviously, I was born here, but my mom is from Iconi, my dad's from Kitty. So, and so I can you know t talk both ends of it, talk to Guyanese and also talk to the, 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 the international law end of it. And you know, the foreign policy end, as I said earlier, I had worked previously with the U.S. State Department and uh, had you know passed the Foreign Service exam and uh, things like that. Many people in the community know me. I've been around the, the, the Queens community. I was also a city council nominee. In the in the past, so uh, you know, I, I think I think quite a few people know me, but always there's there's more people. See, that's why you to, get to, get to more often. Yeah, there's always more, more people to, to, to get to know me, and I look forward to getting to, to know you too. I know that he went to school in England, right? Yeah. Um, so I have um, one law degree from the University of London, and the other one is from Georgetown in deep Washington D.C. That's right. Our our brilliant young yeah. Guyanese guy yeah. here. I was going to say the, the, the version of the song. I like that just with, with the little girl and then Bunty right. Singh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Bunty Singh is one of the better yeah. new yeah. singers. Like, He's know. a good good yeah. good guy. So yes. Yeah. Also, like I said earlier, that um, Rusat is also. Um, running for political office no, um, no, no I'm, I'm, not, I'm not i'm not running not, no, no. Not I, I, I ran before you ran but, before but, yeah, i'm not but running else. what i yeah. want to say um that rusat has a bright future ahead of him when it comes to politics you may see him like i always say rusat i can't wait when the day come that i can visit me just my walk office in the office and say <laughs> listen i just need to see the, the senator man and, and tell him scan <laughs> where i could just walk right in so Welcome again, yeah. and so um, let's but, say hello to some but, of our viewers. But, uh, I, I, actually, I just I just want to make a, a few of more. You know, we were talking earlier, and I was making the point from like the the, the you know academic point, but always you gotta you break it down different ways, right? You ask a question about like you know why why would a guy like Maduro do this now, right? And and let's put it this way. I was saying Maduro was desperate, right? Now, given all the reasons he's desperate for Venezuela, the the crisis Venezuela's been isolated, especially since 2019. Thing, thing is, Maduro is like a guy who his his wife is about to leave him. <laughs> right? No, no, I, I'm no, I'm saying like 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 think of it this way, right? right? And when your wife is about to leave you, that's when you start to get desperate, and that's when you start to do things that you won't do otherwise, right? So think about that way, right? So this thing it didn't flare up before. Be, uh, in the way it is now, we, you always get a little tension here and there, but now it flare up big time because now he feels like. Yeah, you know, his wife might actually leave him. Now he feels like he may actually get kicked out of power. I know no Venezuelan leader actually had to feel that pressure before. You know, other Venezuelan leaders were very stable. Hugo Chavez was there from 1999 to 2013. He was very stable in, in his position. Nicolas Maduro has never been stable in his position. I, again, from, from the beginning when he won his first election, it was very close. And then he had a rigged election after that. And then after the rigged election, you know, the majority of the countries in the world, uh, you know, they said they didn't recognize him as the correct, as, as the rightful leader of Venezuela. The U.S. has had sanctions on him ever since. The U.S. actually has an arrest warrant out for Nicolas Maduro. So, 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 so basically, okay, put it this way. In fact, uh, John Bolton, the former U.S. National Security Advisor, actually had once said, the day Nicolas Maduro leaves office is basically his last day as a free man, right? So that's why a guy like Maduro is very desperate that he, if, you know, one of the uh, former Latin American leaders, uh, because Latin America has a history of you know, dictatorship uh, going a certain way. And one of the former Latin American leaders once said that, look, it's either I stay in office. Uh, he, said, he, said, he said, yeah, he, the quote was, it's either I stay in office, they arrest me, or they kill me. And that's something that a lot of leaders like Maduro find themselves in the position. Okay, put it this way. 
the day Maduro leaves office, is, as John Bolton said, is going to be his last day as a free man. He's probably going to be arrested the, 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 the day he leaves office mm -hmm. by either the opposition when they defeat him right. or by a former or by a, a, a country like the U.S. that yes, has an arrest yeah. warrant out Absolutely. for him. Right? Or you can have you know, some type of internal violence in Venezuela. So that's why a guy like Maduro needs to stay in power at all costs for himself. Right, and right. how do you stay in power at all costs for yourself? Again, like a guy who, who who's desperate, his wife might leave him. You start to do desperate things. You may do things you otherwise wouldn't, and and that is why Maduro is doing things like this right now. Right. So, what? Let's say the, for the people in Essequibo in Guyana, mm -hmm. um, do you think that they should be really worried about Maduro action next? I I, I think it's it's always better to be. Look, I don't, I don't want, want to put, put put people like in 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 say right, in a fright, right, but I think it's always look. It's always better to be prepared than not prepared, right? right. You you don't want to be caught off guard in a situation that you you always. You know, I I was a Boy Scout, and in the Boy Scouts, they always thought you'd be prepared, right? And so I I wouldn't say that the people should be worried as much as they should be prepared for you know it, and that anything could happen. Yeah, and I think I think that um, you know, since America is down there in Guyana, and I'm sure. They have are monitoring the actions of the Venezuelan army and uh, Maduro and so on. So I, I I want to say for me I I agree with you. I would not. Um, I want to be prepared. You never know what someone like Maduro yeah. would want to do. Yeah. What his action would be next. <clears throat> but still, I would not worry too much because I got my big brother next but, to me but you see you want to make sure your big brother is actually okay like put it this way you you, you don't want when the, when the day comes of the fighting man is the first time you talk to your brother in a little while and you gotta give him a little phone call and say okay buddy you coming down no, no you want to make sure your big brother is right there with you on board i i think you know that is what they got to make sure right now okay like, like, like say yeah i okay, put it this way people in this audience right now they probably get their own story going on their own family fight whatever when you get your thing on, you want to make sure your big brother is, is right there with you. You don't want on the day of the showdown, that's when you got to call your brother for the first time. No, no, no. You want to make sure your brother is there with you the whole time. And that's what the, I think they should be doing right now. Okay, good. So, yeah, I, I, I probably would not worry too much, you know, um, but I'll keep my eye on, this, on that man yeah. to see what he is going to do next. <clears throat> um, what my next question to you is... Um, do you think that we are ready, Guyana is ready, the government of Guyana is ready for a confrontation? We know we, we don't have the capacity. Yeah, look, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't say that I'm in a you know, position to, to, to answer that question. I, I would hope that they are. Um, but no, I, 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 I don't think we, we know enough to, to say yes or no, because look, I, I'm sure there's a lot of things that the government is, is doing behind the scenes that they don't have people knowing right, right? so then they, you, you look uh, so look, based on you know what is shown publicly it's it, it, it you, you you can't say you know say for sure yes or no look i i, I don't want to be the guy who says yes and the answer is no and i don't want to say no they're not prepared and in the meantime they're doing a lot of things that we don't even know behind the scenes i think that it's good that they've taken steps to try to keep the public informed i think they need to keep doing that and keep um, you know improving on that um Next, should we get our public officials, like our senators, um, involved in this? Should we be calling them? Yeah, I, I, I think that that it. Look, okay, the the Guyanese diaspora is, is largest in the U.S. Uh, uh, in the sense that there are more Guyanese living in America than in any other part of the, the world, other than Guyana itself. And we have to make the most of having that Guyanese diaspora here, and that's. Importance of getting politically involved. You know, the, the, one of the, the commenters there says, you know, I can tell he's a politician because he's all over the place. You know, that, that's fine, but I, Guyanese in general don't like to get politically involved in, in the U.S. and in, in, within the local politics here. But it's important to get politically involved because it, that is how, when something happens to your home country, you actually can have a voice in affecting that. And if you look at the history of the U.S. and immigrant groups in the U.S. That has played out many times. For example, the Irish community in the U.S. immigrated just like the Guyanese did, but they became very politically involved. And once they did, that's how they were able to have the U.S. play a larger role in the peace process with Northern Ireland 
and the Republic of Ireland. When, if you look at, for example, the Jewish diaspora, which is very large in the US, they're very politically involved in the US. And that's why when something like the Israeli conflict happens, they can make sure their voice is heard. That's something that we need to be conscious of as well. If we are politically active, we can make sure that our voice is heard here when something like the Guyana Venezuela conflict flares up. And the US, so there is the, di the diaspora aspect of why the US should be involved. And there's also the aspect of you know, American history and foreign policy history. The US has always been uh, the, the power of the region and the superpower in the world for the past, uh, since you know, the, cold, the end of the Cold War and the end of the Second World War in particular. And if you look at, for example, the Monroe Doctrine, the, the history is the US has said that in the Western Hemisphere, they are the, the protector. They, they are the one who will uh, you make sure that there is you know, the, the result correlated to the Monroe Doctrine. They will be the one to, 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 to make sure that there's not one country that can just go rogue and do something like what Venezuela is doing now. So there is a, a, res a role and responsibility of the US to make sure there is there is you know, stability here. And as Guyanese Americans living in the US, I think we have a role and responsibility as well to make sure that our representatives get involved. We're in a democracy for a reason, and, and we have to use that right. Um, and you know, one thing I have to say too, that um, I, I, I call Arusat just before five o'clock to get him to come on this show today, because I didn't, I, I, did, I had an allergic reaction today, and so <clears throat> it's bothering my throat because of what I had to do. And so I want to say thanks, Doru, said, for coming on such a short notice um, to be on the show today. And guess what? I didn't even get my questions up to ask you. We are going like, <clears throat> like um, there, there was not enough planning done for the show, and we, I want to bring something for you guys to hear about what's going on in Guyana. <clears throat> um, and again, and thanks, Uncle Ken, for having me here. Well, bless you. I was going to say, on the point I was making just now about Monroe Doctrine, if you look back at the history of it, the U.S. has always had a role in this, in this conflict, right? The Monroe Doctrine, the U.S. position, is the reason that this went to the world court in the first place, right? So if you look back, at, so, you know, Britain and Spain and the Dutch even before then as, as, territory, as, as, as colonial powers always made some type of territorial claim in this region, right? Then as you know, Venezuela as a successor state, uh, they maintained a claim to this region and the British had the claim to this region. But because the US said that we have the Monroe Doctrine, we are the ones who are, we're not gonna let any European power you know, have the final say in this, in this hemisphere. The US is the one who pressured this matter to go before uh, an international tribunal in 1899. And that's why Venezuela and Britain went to the international tribunal in 1899 the tribunal ruled the way it didn't and the, you know, in favor of Great Britain that the land belonged to British Guyana. The lines were drawn as they were and Venezuela accepted the lines at the time, right? Absolutely. right? And, and then it's only 60, 60 years later when Guyana is approaching independence, that's when Venezuela starts to, you know, reject it. But, it, you know, sometimes people forget the role the U.S. played from the beginning. So, at, and at that time, the U.S. and the U.S. and Guyana have had a complicated relationship in the past. But the, re the exact reasons why the U.S. and Guyana had a complicated relationship in the past or why Guyana should be using it in their favor now. So, if, for example, in the 1890s, when this conflict was going on, and many, many people, when they look back, would say the U.S. was more on the side of Venezuela because at that time, in the 1890s, they viewed you know, Britain as this colonial uh, power and Venezuela was more of an independent country and they were you know, more in favor of Venezuela than Britain. In the 60s, when uh, you know the, the U.S. Uh, was opposed to Chetty Jagan, the reason was because it was alleged that Chetty Jagan had Marxist leanings, and the U.S. didn't want another Castro, and that's why they they interfered. Yeah. The same reasons now apply to why the U.S. should support Guyana and not Venezuela and be against Venezuela, because Venezuela today is the socialist country. It's been a socialist country since 1999. Right, so, so the, the, the next, next Castro, Castro is not coming from Guyana, it's coming from Venezuela. Mm -hmm. right? right? If Venezuela invaded Guyana or tried to annex uh, Escobar, that would be the largest act of socialist aggression since the end of the Cold War. And if the US policy throughout the Cold War was opposing the expansion of socialism across the world, right? that's why you had the Korean War and the Vietnam War. And all. So if that's what the US and Americans fought and died for in the, throughout the Cold War era, that's not something that America's gonna accept in its own backyard. 
now. It, that's why America invaded Grenada in, in the 1980s. You know, people forget America invaded Grenada because they didn't want a socialist government in, in Grenada. They, they don't. They're not going to want a socialist expansion in in their own backyard. And you know, America had wanted to take out uh, you know Maduro even in, in 2019. So so they're not. So the same Guyana has to use it to their to their advantage and point out that this is a we have a socialist neighbor in. In Venezuela, who wants to act with aggression and to, and use it to, to their advantage of why the U.S. for the same reasons they acted the way they did in the past should be in Guyana's favor, not Venezuela's favor. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me say hello to um, my aunt Delari Siegel Bin. Um, she, Imran, thanks for watching. He said salam. Um, <clears throat> Yasmin Jamir, thanks for watching. I can't go as fast as I want to because my throat. Uh, it's not it's not working good tonight. Um, <clears throat> who do I have? Stanley, thank you for watching. Henry Vila is watching. Thank you very much. Um, Patsy Ramnarain, a very good afternoon. Good night to you, Pearl. Good evening, Razia Hussein. Good evening, Debbie Sanyasi. Indira, Indira uh, Budu. Good evening to you. Thank you, Ryan Jeffrey. Good evening. My sister Alita Ishtolat Ram is watching from Canada. Um, Tarmati Barka watching. Sh um, Shanti Ahmad, good evening to you. <coughs> Padmini is watching, thank you. Malika, good evening to you too. Naomi Ramdas, my sister, is watching. And yes, Ms. Sabo, uh, he is very smart. He's a young, smart thank you. guy. Um, Roshani, a very good evening to you. Thank you very much. Um, and so, let's see. Bibi Prashad, good evening to you. And we have, um, you know, one thing that I'm watching here is that you know, your mom is very blessed to have a son like you. Um, <clears throat> you worked, I always say, a thousand sons. Um, and I, I, I don't know what she's going through. And I'm thinking while I'm talking to you and listening to you, probably I should interview her one day to see <laughs> how she feels that she's just about a feet away from you. Listening to you talk all these things and saying all these things, it has to make her feel very proud. I don't know... <clears throat> um, you know how she feels, but I, I probably after the show, I will probably talk to her and see um, <coughs> what okay. what I could get out of her. Maybe we could do a Mother's Day show next year. Probably we could do uh, <laughs> we could we should talk to her too. Yes, uh, um, Tarmati Barker, thank you very much. Good evening, um, Nadia Gani. A very good evening to you, um, Felicia Kanai. Good evening to you too, Shaliza Ali. Good evening to you, Selena Moti Ram. A very good evening to you. Um, Hafiza, can I good evening to you? Um, <clears throat> yeah, and like I said today, I had a, I had an allergic reaction with I was eating pear from Guyana um, <clears throat> that I got some here, and all of a sudden I, I didn't eat it with salt or nothing, and I had to run to the bathroom, uh, and so it's not a good thing. But anyway, <laughs> but we I really wanted to do a show, and so <laughs> I would want you to I'll give you the the forum to. Make your closing comments or whatever yeah. you want no, to say. I was going to say, you have some, uh, a very interesting, very interesting conversation. Just, well, the two, well, I think Imran is right about the containment strategy, but also the, you had a commenter just now from S. Equival. So right. you may, I, Let, I, I will look for I, yeah, I, I, I would wish her all the best and, and wonder what, what's her opinion right now. Let's, we we going to look for that. Uh, I, I think it's like Anita or something. Okay, something I'll watch. I, uh, at the bottom just now. And um, also, we have Dear Moti, a very good evening to you. Anita Ramnarain, a very yeah. good evening to you. Yeah, she's watching good night, from everyone watching. Anita, how is things there? Yeah. Are you guys scared? Write something, let us know. Um, <clears throat> what's the, what the people from Esquibo is feeling? Probably I should get some people from Esquibo on the show one day too. But um, I, I would not let people yeah. worry too much. Yeah. Um, just pray a lot and uh, hope that God work in a mysterious way. So I'm going to let you... One one thing that I was going to say earlier, we were talking about the, the history of the conflict. I was saying that uh, you know, the, the conflict flared up in the 1800s, and that's why they ended up going to war court. Some people are be interested to know when you look back at it, one of the reasons it flared up in the 1800s that led to the war court was because there was a gold rush at the time. And and the, both the the Venezuelans and the British wanted to you know claim land where potentially gold could be, right? And if you think about it, what's what's the gold of today? Oil. Oil is the right? man. And you know sometimes history repeats itself, right? So the, it was it's always been resource driven, right? Whether it was oil then, yeah, or oil now, right? It's who controls the resources. But I, that was a, I, thank you, Mr. Roger Singh, is there? 
Hey, Raja, a very good evening to you. How are you? He said one more. Oh, oh, Auntie Shanti. And also, who? Oh, Auntie Shanti? Yes, yeah, Shanti Nath. Auntie Shanti Nath, a very good evening to you. Judy, a very good evening to you. Um, <clears throat> thanks for watching. And um, my girl, Miss Zabita Singh, is watching. I know she get ready and is watching. So, <clears throat> Roger, we're going to come off the air not too long from now. In just a couple of minutes, I had an allergic reaction today. A, so, a, any of your um, questions that we didn't get to? I think we get to Let's all. I, like I said, we didn't have um, uh, invest in our army, and uh, yeah. we, we talk about that already. <clears throat> so, if there's anything that you want to add, Rusat, in our discussion today? Um, um, look, I, 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 I would I just... just uh, wrap up by saying, look, I'm, I'm happy to be on. I, would, I love discussing these topics. At the same time, I, I want us to remember, it's not just, you know, we're over here, we're having discussion and we're talking about what we could do from over here, but at the end of the day, it's a very serious thing on, on the ground for the people there. And we should always you know, think about that. It's it's very easy in New York where people just don't talk, 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 but if Venezuela invades, we're, we're not the ones in, in, the, in the range of fire right away, right? It's, it's the people on the ground. In and, and we, we all, all hope for the best. best. We, we hope, hope that, that nothing comes out of, of this. We hope that Maduro doesn't go as a, as a full madman and you know it, it, do like what Saddam Hussein did or do like what Galtieri did. But we have to remember that this is a very serious situation. And as much as some people may you know make light of it or you know, and say, okay, don't don't worry. Again, I wouldn't use the word worry, but I would say we need to always be cautious and prepared, and we hope that nothing happens. We hope this passes over. We hope this is just a distraction that Maduro is doing. But we have to appreciate the seriousness of the risk because if you if you you know take a step back and forget about the, our personal connection to it and you just analyze it as what have other leaders in the world done in situations like this, there have been times where it doesn't end well, like the Saddam Hussein situation in 1990 when he invaded Kuwait like the Argentine Falkland situation and like the Russia-Ukraine situation where, again, we remember, okay, you know, for the people who remember, many people didn't think Saddam would actually invade Kuwait. Many people didn't think Galtier would actually invade the Falklands. Many people didn't think Putin would actually invade Ukraine. But then the moment it happens, you, it's, it's too little too late afterwards. So we, we hope it, it doesn't, but you, we have to be prepared for every possibility. And that's what the Vice President Barajaito was saying today. He was saying, that he doesn't want people to worry, but that they're also prepared for the worst as well. So you you, you have to have the balance between the two. You don't want people to be worried, but you want them to be be prepared, be cautious, uh, you know, not take it too easy. You, you, look, you don't want a situation where you say, okay, let's say right now, Maduro had the referendum. He doesn't do anything for the next two weeks, right? And all of a sudden, everybody says, okay, let's. Yeah, it's okay. You know, the guy was just blocked. Like nothing's gonna happen. And then come Christmas Day, he actually you know does something, and everybody's caught off guard. Then you don't want to let your guard down and be caught off guard. Then, so I just you know I would say to the overall questions of yours, we have to stay informed. We don't need to. We, I said you, we shouldn't be say worried or scared, but we need to be prepared and stay on high alert because look, even if it's a ten percent chance that the situation becomes that, that's ten percent too much, and you have to take it seriously. That's right. That's right. Um, so yes, and you know, I think it's a good good time now to start invest a little bit in the army in Guyana. Mm -hmm. So in case of anything, we are ready and fully prepared for anything that comes. And one of a good thing too, um, Rusat, <clears throat> I think that since we're having all these oil in Guyana, it would be a prudent thing to invest in your army. Yeah. yeah. Because you don't know. Which next president is going to come in Venezuela and would want to do the same thing? So let's get prepared. I wish all the people in Guyana, especially on the Esquibo region, I wish them good luck and that hope that nothing's happened. And like you said, just be prepared, right? Yeah. Yeah. Any close, anything? Um, and yeah, and, and as members of the diaspora, we have to you know, keep engaged, keep informed on it. It was good that we had the meeting yesterday. It was good. I'm happy that the representatives of the government were there. You know, it was very good. We had you know, former president Sam Hines was there and, and others and people I have a, a, a lot of respect for like him. It, it, it was good to see that. And we need to keep that connection going and we have to grow that connection as well. And as I said, we have to also be politically involved on our end in the US to make sure that our, our voice is heard. We can't forget that as a unit, as a diaspora, we can be a very big voice and we have to Absolutely. make sure that 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 perspective is re reflected as well. 
uh, yeah. So, and you know, I I gotta tell you, we in the diaspora, we are ready to help in any way. Should anything ever happen, you know, we are ready. I am always ready to rock and roll. <laughs> so, um, thanks everyone for watching the show tonight. Um, tune in back again on Sunday afternoon. There is so much today. Like I said, we want to have a show that we didn't want to have a show, but I'm so glad that at the end, Rusa that decided that at the last moment that he's going to come. And thanks, Indy Mohan, for coming in with Rusat in the studio. It's a pleasure having both of you. And we will continue to have these discussions. If there's anything going on, I'll definitely bring in Rusat and some other people so that we could have an informed um, show um, of really what's going on. So until then, have a and, very and, and thanks again to all, all our viewers. viewers. I hope you have a good night. Thanks again for tuning in. Take care. That's right. Oh, let me play one of my favorite songs. And this is going for all the beautiful ladies that's watching. Night to Padmini Jagannath. Thanks for watching. Uh, uh, just, just finishing up an earlier point I was making about. You, you don't want to take your eye too off the ball and get caught off guard later. If you um, you know, thinking back to historical examples right now, if if you do think back, you know, both in the Kuwait situation and in the Russia-Ukraine situation, if you remember Russia-Ukraine last year, there was you know, Putin was threatening the military action around December, and then he didn't do it throughout December, throughout January. He had the build up in February, and then at one point he actually pulled back troops, and you know, people thought, okay, the threat's gone, it's over now. And then what happened two days later? Full on. So, so you can't ever take your eye fully off the ball in a situation with the, with the tension so high. So look, what Maduro, I think Maduro will have a bit of a setback because of the way the referendum turned out. I don't think he got to the resounding, uh, you know, massive support that he wanted. But at the same time, you know, he may, he's the type of guy he can calm down for a little bit. And then you don't want to say, it, everybody, everybody takes, takes their eye off the ball, ball. And, and we, you know, we guys need to get distracted very easily, right? right? You, you don't want to take your eye off the ball. ball. You can come um, New Year's, year's come February, what it, 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 it's a, you know, you took your eye off the ball too much and he's able to do something. So, I just, you know, we just have to remain vigilant and remain uh, attentive to the issue. Absolutely. Ariana V, good evening to you too. Um, also, we have Galena hit the right. A very good evening to you. Eric Furry, a very good evening to you. Great program, Ken. Thanks for keeping. Of course, of course, we got to keep you guys informed. I this is why I have this show, and um, you know I have a very brilliant young man here who I know keep up with all that's going on around the world. May I say? And so anything going on, I'll bring him in back. I have one, two other people I could bring him back, and we are here in in the diaspora, ready to help Guyana in whatever little way we can help, you know. So um, don't worry, have a great night, everyone. Let's continue with our song. Um... Yeah. 